America is great because she is good. But if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. In that context, General, have we lost the moral high ground? Well, I think it's important to remember what Thomas Jefferson said. He said that uh, we are the shining beacon. And uh, like a beacon on a hill, everybody should look to, the, to America, to the United States of America, and see in it uh, a, a society that strives to be good, to do right. Uh, may not always succeed, but it is always striving to do, to do good. And that good is important because it shows the rest of the world that a society can come together, especially a society of immigrants that we are, uh, a mixed society that bring many religious and, and ethnic groups together, racial groups together, and constantly try to improve itself and be better. Uh, General, you refer in your book to the foxhole view and the need for Washington political leaders to not only have the big picture, but also have a foxhole view. What do you mean by that? Well, I've been concerned that many of our political leaders have not had experiences uh, in the world. I mean, many of our, our politicians were proud to claim they didn't have a passport. Many have not served, for example, in, in the Foreign Service or in the military or places where they've got an appreciation for the world. Many come from very narrow backgrounds. It isn't to say they aren't good men and women, it's just they haven't had that experience that sort of gives you the, tempers your decisions with reality and what the world is really like. It's very easy for them to become enamored with strategists, with people that have ideas uh, that may or may not work, but they tend to be academics, people that work in think tanks in Washington and elsewhere that propose strategies and policies and ideas. If those strategies and policies aren't tempered with the view from the foxhole, from those that have been forward in the world, those that understand cultures and societies, what you can do and what you can't do, what the world is really like, if that isn't brought into the equation, we become ideologues. We try to promote ideas and strategies and policies that won't work on the ground or are counterproductive or don't take into account the cultures and, and, and groups you're dealing with, the societies that uh, we'll have a difficult time accepting this. And we can see what's happened is we've tried to implant Jeffersonian democracy around the world now. Uh, first of all, we don't understand these cultures and how that may or may not be received, what it takes to get it to take, whether these cultures are at the point where they have established the structures and everything to, to get a true appreciation and be able to implement them. Uh, so the danger really becomes that you become idealistic, uh, narrow in your outlook, and you aren't tempered with the practicalities and realities of the world on how to implement it. Doesn't mean their ideas and policies aren't good. It's just a matter of application. And without that Foxhole experience, the diplomats, the soldiers, the journalists, the non-governmental organization workers, the aid workers, without their view and, and, and input, I think you can be misled into an idealistic course that gets you. How can a man in a cave outcommunicate the world's leading communication society? And the reason I wanted to ask you about that is that um, has the military adopted technology to the point where they are using it the way our enemies are using it? I mean, they use it skillfully. Does that exist in the military where the people that are in the foxholes? and all the way up the stovepipe can communicate with each other horizontally. I think maybe more so in the military, because the military evolved from a very structured, hierarchical system. I mean, if you were to go back to the military that I joined in 1961 or before that, you would have seen a very top-down oriented military. Uh, orders were given and processed and worked down through layers and layers. What the military has done is flatten the organization, they make less layers, integrated the organization, brought all the functions of the military of operations, planning, intelligence, logistics, and, and melded them together, and have operated on a system where the communication not only goes from the, the, the senior leadership down, but from those in the foxhole literally back up, because they know you need both. Uh, obviously, as I point out in the book, the advantage of being in the foxhole is you see the action. You're right there. You know what's happening on the ground. But sometimes that foxhole gives you a limited view. You don't see the bigger picture. There's an advantage to those that understand the strategy, the oper have the operational big picture, if you will, 
But that has to be blended into the tactical picture right on the ground. I mean, it's necessary for that cross-communication. General, uh, you use in your book, uh, uh, you reference to uh, the war on terrorism. Mm -hmm. And you end the book by talking about this battle for peace. When, it, when we shouldn't be talking about the war on terrorism, I, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but we should be talking about a war against instability. Is that something you would agree with? Yeah, I mean, terrorism is a tactic. How can you declare war against a tactic? The example I was always used, imagine Franklin Delano Roosevelt declaring war against uh, uh, kamikaze attacks or, or Woodrow Wilson declaring war against U-boat attacks. They didn't declare a war against a tactic. It, it, the difficulty now, of course, is we're used to fighting sovereign nations and their forces. That's not what we're up against. So that goes away. You're not fighting Germany, Japan. You're not fighting the, the forces of fascism or Nazism or, or, or militarism in some sense. So you, you, you have a different situation now. Uh, you don't have an enemy that fits the construct that we've always uh, had a, a, in our mind that would be the confrontation between nation states and alliance of nation states. We don't have political ideologies. You know, you have an aberrant form of a religious ideology that's sort of part of this. But I would argue even that is not the root cause of the problem. I mean, what Osama bin Laden needs to succeed is a continuous flow of angry young men. Now, what causes the anger? The anger comes from some political, economic, or social condition that makes him angry. What he's able to do is capitalize on that anger, influence him, uh, and provide a rationale with this aberrant form of Islam that he preaches, and give him justification for what he's going to ask them to do or direct them to do. Uh, when you look at that construct, you say, if you stop the anger, Osama bin Laden dries up.